Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody here. Um, for those of you, um, a lot of us aren't, haven't been here that long, and we have some newer people to some of us that are new here, but they've been here long before we were here. So I'd like to welcome back all the prior, prior attendees. Thank you for being here. If there is anybody here that's new for the first time, we have some cards in front of you. If you'd like, you can fill out that card, drop in the offering plate on your way out. If we notice you or if you make yourself known, we'll give you a gift bag, has some information on the church, and has a gift card for a cup of caribou coffee. So find one of us and we'll make sure we get that to you. There will be fellowship downstairs. I verified that, in fact, there are donuts. And I know that Joe Case tested one, and I think it's OK. So I'm still alive. He's still here. <laughs> Matt. Matt has a, Matt's going to present something. Matt, when you good morning, I'm up here on behalf of the trustees. A couple years ago, as you may, may know, we had a failure in the flat roof. Um, we had major leakage coming through. And then about a year and a half ago, we had that uh, completely redone. The flat roof was redone, uh, fixed. So the good news is no water is coming in. The bad news is we have some severe damage on the inside that we would like to take care of. So just a couple of pictures if you haven't seen. So this is in the pastor's office and in the north room. Some big water stains, um, sheet rock has failed. And so we've had some different bids, and we have a bid to about $35,000 uh, to get that repaired, and that involves um, taking everything down. And then they also strongly suggested that we put in some, it's not insulated, or if it is, it's very, very little in that area. So they recommended some spray foam insulation, and then they strongly encouraged us to have a drop ceiling in the north room that would allow us to have easy access to any other future repairs that we need to do um, again that's about thirty-five thousand. and then with that project we would really we really need to upgrade the lighting in the church um, so if especially downstairs if you've seen <laughs> things like that or you've tried to turn on the light switch and the lights are not coming on and Um, especially during the summer and the humidity really impacts that. These fixtures are not set up for the new LED bulbs that are out. So that project will involve replacing all of the 
for us at Mighty in the building, so upstairs and downstairs, and that's quote is about twelve thousand dollars, a little over twelve thousand dollars, I believe. And benefit of that is that's LED. So as we all know, LED is much more efficient lighting. Um, waste is minimal for that. Um, so we want to put these projects together because uh, we know once that's completed, then we can do the light. The church does have some funds to help us get started, but we don't want to drain those funds. We have some other unknowns, and so we want to keep some of that savings. So we are looking to the church body to help raise some funds. So in your bulletin, there is a pledge sheet that says South by Sandy Upgrade. And that when you have time, we ask that you please review that, look that over, and pray about what you and your family can do to help support this project. So you'll see this information for a few weeks. Um, we'll have information after today out on the bulletin, so I don't have to keep coming out front to talk to you about it. Uh, but again, just take some time, you and your family, to pray about how the Lord can direct you. Maybe pledge a weekly, monthly, or a one-time gift. And as we start to get those funds in, we'll start to see what kind of actions we can take to help make these uh, improvements in the building. So, thank you. Yeah, so just earmark it, um, repair. <laughs> <laughs> so we know. Yeah. Give it to the math fund? Yeah, the math. V E N N E M. Thank you, Matt. We had a good annual meeting last Sunday. A number of things were discussed. The financials looked pretty good. And then we had a new election for a bunch of offices. And for those of you that were looking up here this morning, as you sat there, you may have seen who's been elected and stuff. And I'm not going to go through that right now. If you have any questions on that, talk to a trustee or talk to really um, any of the members. We can probably let you know who's filling what slots. I would like to welcome Pastor Bob back. KC tried to sneak in and no one saw him much. That's how he's here. So this is all good. Are there any other announcements? Anybody have? Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for bringing us together this morning. We thank you for this, this beautiful day. We thank you that by your grace you have pulled us together into this building at this time as part of your church. We ask that the Holy Spirit would work in us this morning, that we would be able to retain that which we hear, and that it would transform us, change us more into the likeness of you. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Would you please follow along as we read the coming worship insert? If you could please read in the bold print. <coughs> O oh, great God of wonders, we worship you for who you are, the eternal, unchanging one in three. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does such wonderful things. Let's stand together now as we lift our voice to worship the Lord in song. <laughs>
If you could please take your insert again and follow along or look up at the screen. As I read, we acknowledge our need and rejoice in our Savior. Of all God's great wonders, none is greater than the wonder of his matchless grace revealed in the gospel. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Ephesians chapter 2. Would you bow your heads with me now for moments of silent confession and thanksgiving. We thank you for your grace and love to us, God. It is overwhelming to us how much you love us and that your free gift of grace is there for us all. Lord, we just give you praise and glory and honor that we can be here today. Worship you in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we worship the Lord in song if you're able to. <coughs>
have Pastor Steve with us again, so we'll ask him to come forward at this time. But he, he brought his lovely wife with him, so everybody make her feel at home, too. Okay? <laughs> Steve, thank you very much for coming. Apparently, I was I made a joke the last time I introduced him, and I was reprimanded by certain someone close to me. <laughs> and uh, I would apologize to Steve, but I meant no dishonor to him or anything like that. I would just tell you that. So. Thank you, Steve. I wonder who he was talking about. <laughs> I'd like to begin with a question. What does it mean when a pastor takes off his watch and sets it on the pulpit before he begins to preach? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> I also have a statement I'd like to make up front. There, there are two easy ways to determine what's important to a person, I believe. One is what they spend their money on, and two is where they spend their time. Now during my 36 years as a pastor, I hardly spent any pulpit time preaching on money matters. I did a little bit, but really not too much. And speaking about money seemed like a surefire way to, to get in trouble with people, and the people pleaser tendency kind of kicked in. So. So seeing that I'm no longer a pastor, I don't have to worry about speaking on that topic anymore, so I'll leave that in the very capable hands of your pastor, Bob. However, I'd like to spend my time this morning talking about time. In fact, I'd like to offer two insights up front. First, time is more valuable than money. You can always get more money, but you can't get more time. And second, time is a wonderful way of showing us what really matters. Let's just take a moment to pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege to be here this morning with my brothers and sisters at South by Sandy Baptist. It's good to worship with them, to, to minister amongst them. And I just pray, God, that right now that your, your grace would uh, pour out upon each and every one. And I pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to empower me to use this weak vessel, vessel to present your powerful word. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Human beings are creatures of time, and we're, we're preoccupied with it. We, we wear watches that we can keep account of time. We, when your wife is slowly getting ready for your dinner date to her favorite fancy restaurant that you've made reservations for, Texas Roadhouse, and you remind her, have you noticed what time it is? And we often ponder to ourselves, how much time do I have left? The concept of time has been problematic for philosophers. It's even con uh, produced considerable controversy amongst theologians as to precisely how time is employed in the divine scheme of things. Yet one thing is certain, scripture makes a clear distinction between the temporal and the eternal. Paul says that the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. That's from 2 Corinthians 4. And in describing God, the psalmist declares, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And in that same text of man, it says, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, and they quickly pass and fly away. Time clearly does not relate to God and man in the same way. God doesn't wear a watch or use a calendar for that matter. The Bible says with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. God deals within the context of eternity and is therefore not bound by time as we are. Time is measured by a beginning and an end. Eternity, on the other hand, has always been and always will be. So clearly the span between the beginning and the end, for lack of a better expression, is called time. Theologian Carl Henry characterized time as the divinely created sphere of God's preserving and redemptive work and the arena of man's decision on his way to an eternal destiny. So this morning I'd like to offer some suggestions to help us be all that God has created us to be. And, and first of all, I'd like to say that we need to recognize the value of time. This, as Henry puts it, arena of decision on our way to eternity. Think about it. How do we value one year? 
Ask a student who failed a grade and had to take it over again. How do we value a month? Ask a mother whose baby is born prematurely. How do we value one week? Ask the pastor who's perfectly preparing his sermon for Sunday. How do we value one hour? Ask someone who lies in bed, terminally ill, waiting for a delayed loved one to arrive. How do we value one minute? Ask someone who missed a plane, a very important engagement that would never be rescheduled. And how do we value one second? Ask an Olympic athlete, someone who just missed third place at the finish line. Time is important to us because we live in a limited time frame. We begin through infancy, then go into adolescence, adulthood, middle age, old age, and ultimately into eternity. We measure life in segments of time. Now what makes something valuable? Oftentimes it's its scarcity. If there is a shortage, then that product quickly escalates in value. So if something is rare, it's usually valuable. But if we have a lot of it, it loses value. The same is true with time. Young people feel that they have plenty of time, therefore time loses its value. And they aren't too concerned about wasting or squandering it. And on the other hand, as we get up in years, we begin to realize that our time is becoming rare, and therefore more valuable. So those of us nearing 60 or older tend to look at those under 20 and say, don't squander time because it's very valuable. And then those young whippersnappers will reply, no, it's not. We have lots of time, so we can waste it any way we want. And isn't it ironic that as a child, we say, if only I were a teenager. And as a teen, we say, if only I were an adult. And as an adult, if only I were married. And as a spouse, if only I had kids. And as a parent, if only my kids were grown up. And in an empty house, if only the kids would visit. And as a retiree in a rocking chair with stiff joints and fading sight, if only I were a kid again. You see, the trouble is we think we always have time. Yet the Bible often speaks of the brevity of life. The psalmist writes, teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. Scripture compares life to the shadows of summer that quickly disappear, to grass which grows up and dies and then is burned. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. No wonder the psalmist asks God, what is man that you are mindful of him? Statisticians tell us that the average lifespan is around 75 years. If you're under 30, then you think, that's a long time. If you're around my age, you're beginning to realize that it's really not that very long at all. I came across some interesting statistics. Someone went to the trouble to research what people do with their time, and these are the results they came up with. If we live to be 75, most of us will spend three solid years, that's 24 hours as a day, acquiring an education, grade school, high school, college, and so on. We'll spend seven years of our lives eating, some more, some less, obviously. We'll spend 14 years working. We'll spend five years riding in automobiles, airplanes, and other forms of transportation. We'll spend five years talking with each other, again, some more, some less. We'll spend one year sick or recovering from sickness. And get this, we'll spend 24 years of our lives sleeping. We'll spend three years reading books, magazines, newspapers, and 12 years of recreational activities, watching TV, on our phones, going to movies, recreational sports, hobbies, hunting, fishing. Furthermore, if within these 12 years we included church participation, for 75 years from infancy through adulthood, never missing a worship service or Sunday school, that would only account for 11 months of said 12 years. All this totals up to 75 years, and that is what the researchers say the, on the average most of us will have done with our lives. This tells us a little bit of the brevity of, of time, and it also can tell us something about the priorities in life. Dr. James Dobson rightfully observed, if we fully comprehend the brevity of life, our greatest desire would be to please God and to serve one another. I'll touch on that later. The Bible also teaches us that life is uncertain. 
Time is like a valuable commodity in a very precious and delicate vessel, a jar of clay, we could say. It might break at any moment and we might lose it all. So we have this moment. We don't know anything about the future, but we have this moment. That's all we really have. Because of the uncertainty of life, the Bible says now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And the Bible also says, and this is the, ver the passage that I would like to kind of touch on for the rest of today. In Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, it says, be very careful how then, then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. And the English Standard Version says, making the best use of our time. The NIV says making the most of every opportunity. And the King James says redeeming the time because the days are evil. Because life is uncertain, we must take advantage of the time that we have. Furthermore, if uncertainty keeps you up at night, close your eyes and think on something that is certain. And that is that God loves you. And he has a plan and purpose for your life. We live in a time-starved society that relentlessly pushes us to the limits. Work more, buy more, do more, accomplish more, rush, rush, hurry, hurry, and more productive, more efficient, more expedient, more, more, more. It's insane what passes for the norm today. And if someone asked, are you really enjoying your life? Many of us would have to say no, and I don't have time to talk about it. <laughs> Busyness has become somewhat of a status symbol. If we're busy, we're important. If we're not busy, well, we're almost embarrassed to admit it. Busyness is where we get our security. It's validating. It's, it's popular. It's pleasing. But it's also a good excuse for not dealing with the first things in our lives. We're always rushed, always on the move, never having enough time. Tragically, most people have little time for the things in life that they would say are most important to them. When we overschedule ourselves and the belief that we can do everything, we stop being human and try becoming almost godlike. Not only impossible, but also arrogant. Many of us living at a pace that is not only unsustainable, but it's also unbiblical. While busyness is categorically the norm for the vast majority of us, the solution is never about having more time. We know this, but still we forget such an essential truth. People will often say, and I'm guilty as well, I wish there were more hours in a day. If only I had more time. Why do we want more time? What would we do with it? We want more time to do the important things that aren't getting done. This list might include time to rest, time spent with God, or simply time to enjoy our family and loved ones. But let's be honest. What if God suddenly said, I'm giving you one extra hour a day. You have 25 hours a day. Or better yet, what if he decided to give us an eighth day in the week, which amounts to over three extra hours a day? How would you spend that time? Would you use it for an afternoon nap or get caught up in last month's expense report? Would you use it for meaningful conversation with your spouse or to get the oil changed because it's five months overdue? Extra prayer and reflection time with God or online serving for the best deal on a 70-inch TV you want for your living room? I suspect most of us would spend our new 25-8 catching up on chores, doing more work, and finding lost schoolmates on social media. Would you really spend a solid hour of meaning conversation, conversation with your aging mother or teenage son? Despite good intentions, I'm as likely as the next person to try to get a caught up in all those areas that have been, been spilling over the edge. You see, the answer isn't more time, but a greater awareness of the time we already have. It's like a car whose wheels aren't aligned. It always pulls us to one side. And if you don't constantly fight it, that little tug will drag you right off the road. And the constant battle to keep the vehicle within the lines becomes exhausting. No one wants to drive very far from their, when they're out of alignment. And the, and the culture we live in is forever pulling us off center. Go faster, work harder, stay busy. And if we don't fight it, we're only headed for the ditch. We're back on the wide road with everyone else. And what is the broad path? 
lead to according to Jesus leads to destruction. So instead of our typical conclusion that we simply don't have enough time, what if we embrace the truth, no matter how strange it may seem? And the truth is this, you have enough time to do everything God wants you to do. God has given you everything you need to accomplish all that he wants you to do, including enough time. We don't need more time. We need to use the time we already have differently. We need to do as Paul said, make the best use of our time. Make the most of our opportunity. You have time for what you choose to invest your time in. Every day, most of us say, I just don't have time to work out or to read the Bible or to go to church this week or to meet for lunch or to add one more thing. But the truth is, and believe me, I'm preaching to myself here. We find time for what's important to us. If golf is really a priority to us, we find time to play golf. If going to dinner with our friends matters, we make it happen. If tanning, working out, getting our hair cut, our priority, we seem to find the time. So catch your time yourself the next time you're about to say, I don't have time for something, and tell yourself the truth. Either it's not a priority, or you're guarding time for good reason, or you simply aren't willing to choose to spend your time on it. Normal people do normal things at normal breakneck pace and never have enough time to do the most important things. And that's why we're called to buck the trend of accelerating business and reset our race engines to God's speed. Fueled by faith and a passion for our true priorities, we're going to drive against traffic in order to make time for what matters most in life. Dr. Bob Moorhead wrote a little article entitled The Paradox of Our Time. Very, very good, and I'd like to share it with you. He, he writes, the paradox of our time in history is that we have taller buildings but shorter tempers, wider freeways but narrower viewpoints. We spend more but have less. We buy more but enjoy less. We may have bigger houses and smaller families, more conveniences but less time. We have more degrees and less sense, more knowledge but less judgment, more experts yet more problems, more medicine and less wellness. We drink too much, smoke too much, spend too recklessly, laugh too little, drive too fast, get too angry, stay up too late, get up too tired, read too little, watch TV too much, and pray too seldom. We have multiplied our possessions but reduced our values. We talk too much, listen too little, love too seldom, hate too often. We've learned how to make a living but not a life. We've added years to life but not life to years. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but have trouble crossing the street to meet a new neighbor. We conquered outer space, but not inner space. We've done larger things, but not better things. We've cleaned up the air, but polluted the soul. We've conquered the atom, but not our prejudice. We write more, but learn less. We plan more, accomplish less. We've learned to rush, but not to wait. We build more computers to hold more information, to produce more copies than ever, but we communicate less and less. These are the times of fast food and slow digestion, big men and small characters, steep profits and shallow relationships. These are the days of two incomes but more divorce, fancier homes but broken homes. These are days of quick trips, disposable diapers, throwaway morality, one night stands, overweight bodies and pills that do everything from cheer to quiet to kill. It is a time when there is much in the showroom window and nothing in the stock room. A time when technology can bring this letter to you, and a time when you can choose either to share this or delete it. Remember to spend some time with your loved ones, because they are not going to be, be around forever. Remember, say a kind word to someone who looks up to you in awe, because that little person soon will grow up and leave, you, leave your side. Remember to give a warm hug to the one next to you, because that is the only treasure you can give with your heart, and it doesn't cost a cent. Remember to say I love you to your partner and your loved ones, but most of all, mean it. A kiss and embrace will mend hurt when it comes from deep inside you. Remember to hold hands and cherish the moment, for someday that person will not be there again. Give time to love, give time to speak, and give time to share the precious thoughts in your mind. And always remember, life is not measured by the number of breaths we take, but by those moments that take our breath away.
A while back, an expert on the subject of time management was speaking to a group of business students. You may have heard this before. And after speaking to them for a while, he said, okay, this, it's time for a quiz. And he set a one gallon wide mouth mason jar on the table in front of him. And then he produced a dozen fist sized rocks and carefully placed them one at a time inside the jar. And when the jar was filled to the top and no more of those rocks would fit inside, he asked, is this jar full? Everyone in the class said, yes. Really, he said. Then he reached under the table and pulled out a bucket of gravel and he dumped some gravel into the jar and shook it and the, causing the gravel to work itself through to the spaces of the big rocks. And then he smiled and asked the group once more, is the jar full? And they said, probably not. Good, he replied. And as he reached under the table and brought up a bucket of sand, he started dumping the sand and it filled all the spaces between the rocks and the gravel. And once more, he said, is the jar full? No, the class shouted. Again, he said, good. Then he grabbed a pitcher of water and began to pour the water until the jar was filled to the brim. He looked at the class and he said, what's the point of this illustration? The one eager beaver raised his hand and said, the point is no matter how full your schedule is, if you try really hard, you can always fit something else in there. No, he said, the truth is this. If you don't put the big rocks in first, you'll never get them in at all. What are the big rocks of your life? In other words, what things are most important in your life? And if you're not working on those things, why aren't you? In my 36 years of vocational ministry as a youth pastor and then as a pastor, I have on numerous occasions been with people on their deathbed or in their last days. You know, I never heard, I never heard of one of them say, I wish I'd spent more time at work. Never heard them say, could you pull up my bank accounts so I can see how much money I have left? Never heard them say, can you bring all my trophies and medals so I can look at them to relive the old glory days one more time? I never heard any of that uttered. Rather, across the board, what mattered most to those I've been with at the end of their lives was being with the people whom they love. And my point is this, if relationships will matter most then, shouldn't they matter most right now? Brothers and sisters, there's, there's only one thing more precious than our time. And that's who, not what, but who we spend our time on. Relationships are truly what matters most in life, vertically with our God, and horizontally with the people in our lives. Those are the big rocks in the mason jar of our lives. And when asked what the greatest commandment was, Jesus responded, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Love is a relational word. So first and foremost, our relationship with God and then our relationship with the people in our lives are to be our priority. Regarding God as our first priority, the Apostle Paul writes in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And in Philippians he wrote, For to me, living is for Christ, and dying is even better yet. Philippians 3, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I keep working toward that day when I will finally be all that Christ Jesus saved me for and wants me to be. No, dear brothers and sisters, I am, not, I am still not all I should be, but I am focusing all my energies on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I strain to reach the end of the race, and receive the prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us up, up to heaven. I am focusing all my energies on this one thing. Now, Paul obviously did more than one thing. He made tents. He preached sermons. He established churches. He healed the sick. He wrote letters. He did a lot of different things. But he said, the top priority in my life 
is to press on toward the goal for the prize for which God has called me. What was that goal? To know Christ. To be like Christ. To obey Christ. To live for Christ. Truth is, the key to experiencing God's abundant life is keeping him in his rightful place in our priorities. Friends, God doesn't want a portion of your life. He requires all of you. He desires full custody of our time. He, he's even concerned about the nitty-gritty, seemingly insignificant details of our lives. In, in Corinthians, he writes, so, Paul writes, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Paul urges us to do everything, even eating and drinking, to the glory of God. And as Christians, we're so prone to compartmentalize our lives, God, family, work, and so on. We, we may, for instance, be well aware that God is concerned about how we treat others, our prayer life, and our service to him, but we may assume that he's not concerned about how we spend our free time and conclude that we have free reign on our downtime, that we are not accountable to God then. Nothing could be further from the truth. God wants to be glorified in everything we do. Whether serving in the church or watching a movie on Saturday evening. And in Colossians 3, Paul challenges us, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when we do everything as unto the Lord, we will weed out the things that squander our time, and therefore for we redeem our time. And right now, as you're, as you're listening to me, how many other thoughts are swimming around in your head? Normally, we all have so much on our minds, so many things to remember and to get done. And you have a lot going on at your job. Your kids have a ball game. You need to go grocery shopping or, or get a haircut and so on and so on. And when, when you're with the people you love, chances are good your mind may not be. Wives in particular will often say that even when their husbands are home, their minds frequently seem elsewhere. And I'm guilty as the next guy. For years, this has been the normal scenario at my house. Sharon will be talking to me about something, anything, and since my mind is elsewhere, I'd slip into barely acknowledging her with an occasional, uh-huh, yeah, mm-hmm. And after a few minutes, she'll abruptly say, are you listening to me? And then my survival instincts kick in, and, and I quickly and miraculously repeat her last few words to prove that I was listening, even though both of us know that I wasn't. And I know each of you have a lot going on in your life. But I'd like to offer you a life principle that is radical, yet reasonable. And more than that, it's a life principle that is crucial and necessary in regard to your relationships. And that is this, wherever you are, be all there. Whether with your friends, your family, your Heavenly Father, be all there. Give your undivided attention. Wake up from your long relational nap and fully engage and enjoy the people in your life. They are a gift. Most people live distracted lives. Rarely are they fully present. However, there are a few who silence the distractions and remain fully in the moment. And it's an uncommon practice to radically improve your quality of life and the depth of your relationships. And when you're with the people you love, do you connect intimately and enjoy each other? Or do you just exchange essential information? Do you have plenty of quality time with the creator of this universe, the one who made you, the one who saved you, so that all things fall into place? Or are you set on status quo and usually lack time for what's most important? <laughs> if you're feeling troubled by your answers, consider once again Paul's admonition. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't let culture divert you from living in the present, being fully engaged with your Lord and Savior and the people around you. Don't, don't let the chaotic pace of normalcy tug you in the wrong direction. And you'll, you'll have to fight against that daily drift, others' expectations, the urgent un, uh, but unimportant, or you'll get swept away by what's normal. Be different. Notice the relationship between the choices we make, wise or foolish, and understand the Lord's will. It's critical to God that we think about how we live. 
And how do you stay grounded in the present? By scheduling wisely. You must have the courage to say no. You have to start saying no to good things so you'll be able to say yes to the best things. The closer you are to God, the closer you are to your family, the more you'll stand out from the culture around us. When you're zeroed in on what is essential to God, when you're focusing on what's important to your spouse and children, you will live differently. You will invest your time differently. You want to know something else? You'll be happier. And I close with this. I read about a dad who realized he was so busy that he was missing most of his kids' lives. He never planned to take them for granted or deliberately chose to miss out on quality time with them, but he realized that this time with them would continue to melt away faster than a popsicle in July unless he found a way to slow down and savor the present. So when the oldest daughter was a sophomore in high school, he did something that changed his family's life. The wise father purchased a bunch of marbles. Back at home, he carefully counted out 143 marbles and put them in a large jar. And according to the dad's calculation, he had 143 Saturdays left before his oldest daughter graduated from high school and left home. So the father put 143 marbles in a jar, and each Saturday he pulled one out. And the visual reminded him of the importance of investing his time in places that mattered. It was inevitable that he would lose his marbles, but at least this way he got to decide where they went. <laughs> and despite our best efforts, we're all losing our marbles. It's just a matter of how we'll enjoy each one. And God gives us an amazing present every day. Most people leave this gift unwrapped unrealized, unappreciated, and it's gone before they know it. However, there are few who know that there is no time like the present. May we be numbered amongst the few. You know, I thought about buying a bunch of marbles and giving them to each of you as a visible reminder, but, but that would have gotten expensive. Probably would have just thrown them away or given them to your kids or grandkids anyway. So instead, I'd like to offer you this. How many of you are wearing a watch this morning? Raise your hand if you got one on. Okay? I wear one every day. And so I want to encourage you to do this. How about each morning when you put that watch on? Make that action a visible reminder. And offer a prayer using Paul's words from Ephesians 5. Lord, help me make the best use of the time. Make the most of the opportunity. Redeeming the time. For the days are evil. In Jesus' name. Let's get together as we close our service this morning, just worshiping the Lord and get that song. Um.
Again, Paul's words. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God.